Welcome to the Sayings of Jesus. In today's message, Salt and Light, Dr. McLuhan teaches how Jesus empowered us as his followers to be salt and light to everyone we meet. The sayings of Jesus are some of the most beautiful words ever spoken by any of the well-known spiritual leaders who have walked the face of this earth. For example, no one ever said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 44. Jesus did not just say, love your enemies. He actually loved his enemies. You remember Jesus saying from the cross, for those who are about to crucify him, he just looked down and he said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. Luke chapter 23 and verse 34. The sayings of Jesus were written down by people who heard Jesus speak or who knew him personally. Now, by contrast, the person who wrote down the sayings of Muhammad never knew him and never met him. And according to the standard Islamic narrative, Muhammad died in 632. And the first collection of the sayings of Muhammad were written down by a man by the name of Ibn Isham in 833. And by the t that time, there were no living witnesses for Ibn Isham to interview. Muhammad's sayings were not written down until more than 200 years after his death. And so Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John all knew him, Jesus personally or interviewed people who listened to the sayings of Jesus, met him face to face, and remembered exactly what he said. That is why the sayings of Jesus have been preserved accurately and still carry the same power they had when Jesus first said them. Now, some of the most famous words that were spoken by Jesus were, it came across in what's called the Sermon on the Mount. And tradition tells us that this is where the Sermon on the Mount was first given on a hill near the town of Capernaum. On the top of this mountain, as you see, is a lovely chapel commemorating the Beatitudes of Jesus. And included in these sayings are the words, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Matthew chapter 5, verse 3 and 6. What powerful words these are. In this series of sayings, this message and those statements in this series of sayings of Jesus set the tone for exploring and understanding what Jesus was all about. And today we'll consider two of the sayings of Jesus that were also spoken during the same sermon. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13. And salt is uh, one of the most fundamental ingredients of the s sacrifices that went on in the temple. It was the simplest and purest of the offerings that the people were invited to bring. Uh, salt is a preservative. A couple months ago, or a couple years ago, Pastor Margaret was in the West Bank visiting friends, and they took her to the town of Migdal. And Migdal is the home of Mary Magdalene, and, and it was where the fish that were collected or farmed or, or uh, caught in the Sea of Galilee were salted before they were taken to Jerusalem. It's a place that Jesus visited. It's where he met Mary Magdalene. There's a synagogue there where he preached. And some of these sayings that we've heard today were given in this town. People understood salt and the power that it contains and the value that it has. Salt enhanced the tastes of just about everything. Can you imagine cooking? Sometimes you say, this meal is bland. It just needs a touch of salt. Not a lot, just a touch and the touch of salt makes all the difference in the world. Now, I'm not asking you to empty the salt shaker. Sometimes you see people doing that, and I'm going, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Just a touch is enough. Uh, and so this uh, helps us understand the saying of Jesus. Uh, to help us understand more about the saying, let's just recall a couple of English expressions. Let's see if you know these. Have you ever heard someone say, that person's not worth his salt? Have you ever heard that? And what in the world does that mean? Well, salt was so valuable 
uh, back in the Roman days, the army soldiers sometimes were paid just with bags of salt, containers of salt, because it was such a valuable uh, commodity in those days. Or have you heard the expression uh, like this, uh, take that with a grain of salt. salt. And what do we mean when we say take it with a grain of salt? We're saying what you just heard might not be exactly the pure truth. Is that right? That's what we mean by that saying. And when we want to know the pure truth, it's the salt that keeps things pure. What a great way of thinking about it. And so uh, have you been salty this week? Have I been salty this week? Have uh, people been around us and, and had that taste of what heaven is like, a taste of what God is like, a taste of what it's like to have a relationship of, with Jesus? Have you been worthy of your salt as a Christian this week, flavoring the lives of people? So what steps can we take to improve our saltiness? You know, you can't make a horse drink, but you can feed him salt, right? And that'll make the horse want to drink. And so we want to be salty so that people want to know more about the relationship that we have with Jesus. Uh, people that we are salty around, that we come in contact with, give us a taste uh, for the, give people a taste for the purity of God in our lives and in their lives. So earlier I quoted the saying, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. That's another very powerful saying of Jesus. So um, are you hungry? Did you come hungry today as you watch online? Are you hungry for the thirsty? Are you thirsty for the righteousness of God in your life? Our saltiness can cause people we meet to be hungry and thirsty for who God is and what it is like to have him as a part of our lives. Now Jesus went on to say that salt that has lost its taste, if salt has lost its taste, how shall the saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by people. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13. So here's a question for the cooks in the house today. Have any of you amazing cooks listening to this message ever thrown out old salt or useless salt? And I suspect you haven't actually done that. And so we're trying to understand what Jesus was saying, you know that you put salt in a glass jar, it's good forever, isn't that right? I mean, as long as I know, you can keep it. Um, so what, what is Jesus talking about? And the only way salt becomes worthless if something else is added to the jar intentionally or accidentally, uh, where it's contained with something like sugar or dirt or uh, pests or moisture would de destroy the salt and it would be no good any longer. I heard somebody say one time they used to take salt like that, there was no, no longer any good, and throw it on the temple floor uh, so that the ice might melt during the winter. Do you know that it snows in Jerusalem? I've been in Jerusalem in the snow. And uh, so that it would melt the ice uh, that would accumulate when people came up to worship the Lord. And so uh, the biblical Dead Sea is famous for its salt flats. If you've ever seen these salt flats, they're amazing. But they're not the best source of salt at all. As you see this picture of these salts, you can see all the salt there. And you can, uh, you can buy Dead Sea salt. And uh, this is a label from a, a piece of Dead Sea salt. And it says, uh, Dead Sea salt. But when you actually get down to the ingredients... Uh, you'll see down on that line, it's only 1.5% sodium chloride. And so the Dead Sea is not the best place for salts because there's all sorts of other minerals that are mixed in with that salt. And so the Dead Sea is mainly mined for its minerals, not for table salt at all. And so uh, that's uh, something to understand. The best source for salt uh, is mined in caves and in mountains. And in our home, we like to use Himalaya mountain salt. Isn't it amazing up in the Himalaya mountains? There's salt, a further testimony to Noah's great flood. What a tremendous testament that is. Now, in this parable or in this saying, Jesus was not talking about physical salt, was he? He was talking about spiritual salt. And so Mark makes this very clear when he recalls Jesus as saying it this way. Remember these sayings of Jesus were not said one time. They were said over and over and over to different audiences and emphasizing different things. Salt is good, Jesus said. 
But if salt has lost its saltiness, how will it be salty again? That salt, have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Mark chapter 9 and verse 30, uh, verse uh, 50. Isn't that, isn't that a wonderful statement? Yeah. And so we, we just release to you saltiness, that you be a salty Christian. We did, used to do a play called Salty. <laughs> and uh, we want to be salty for Jesus. So Jesus invites us to do our best to be at peace with others. And Jesus wants us to live in a way that preserves righteousness in society and causes others to hunger and thirst for the way God does and the way God lives and the way God wants us to help us to live our lives. Now, the second saying that we want to explore today is one of the great I am statements that Jesus made. In John's gospel, we read, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world and whoever follows me will not walk in darkness but will have the light of life. John chapter 8 and verse 12. What a wonderful verse. Now, Jesus could say this because he was present at creation. He was present when light was formed. And Jesus is the one who appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus as the brightest light Paul ever saw. It was so bright, in fact, he went blind and was blind for three days until God sent a godly man along to pray for him and open not just his physical eyes but his spiritual eyes to see that Jesus is the light of the world. Paul said the light of Jesus was brighter than the midday sun. That was his testimony. And when Paul asked, who is this light? He heard a voice saying, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now, I used to think that was the only time Jesus appeared to people and spoke to people. But as a young boy, I heard the story about a man from India, and his name is Sadhu Sundar Singh. Have you ever heard the story of Sadhu Sundar Singh? I'll tell you about the word Sadhu. His name is Sundar Singh. He was raised in a wealthy Sikh family. It's not hard to tell uh, meet Sikhs when you meet them on the street. There are Sikhs that live right here in town. The men never cut their hair, and they wrap it all up in a turban around their head. If you've seen some of the movies with Sikhs in it, you'll see all of that. And the young boys, they often have a, a bun, a, a male bun right here that's always covered and tightly wrapped so you can tell who is a Sikh. And it's a form of Hinduism, but not exactly Hinduism. It's another whole branch, and they have all sorts of practices that are so interesting. Now, Sundar lived a normal life until he reached his late teen years. And he was often cruel to followers of Jesus in India. And one day, he and his friends decided to go down to where a group of followers of Jesus were gathering and take cow dung and throw it at them and disrupt the service. And that's what they did. It was an awful experience. Amazingly, the pastor approached Sundar and used one of the sayings of Jesus. He said, Jesus taught us to love our enemies, and he gave him a copy of the New Testament. And that night, Sundar burned the Bible in front of his friends, continuing his rage. And the, worst, uh, the longer Sundar lived, the more unhappy his life became. Until one night, in desperation, he decided to kill himself and cried out to God, if you don't appear to me, I'm going to kill myself before the first morning train comes by the house. And as he lay in bed that night, Jesus appeared to him and said to him, I am the light of the world. And he invited Sundar to follow him. What an amazing story. He did, and he became a great follower of Jesus, and he earned the title Sadhu. Remember I used that? And that's simply a holy man in the East, in Jainism, Hinduism, Sikhism, some of those Eastern religions, Buddhism. Sadhu is a holy man, and people recognized him as Sadhu because of the change in his life and his attitude, and he began to share the message of Jesus with the people of India especially in the northern regions and some in those difficult states up there in Kashmir and Punjab and up into Nepal and even towards Tibet. And in other parts of the world, God took him around the world, Canada, here in the U.S., to share the message of Jesus. 
Now, in my travels around the world, I've met many people to whom Jesus has appeared as a bright light and invited people to follow him. Jesus is still doing that because Jesus is the light of the world. He passed that mantle onto you and to me. He said, you are the light of the world. Can you imagine how that must have felt to that band of people who gathered on that mountaintop? First he said, you're the salt. Then he said, you're the light. They must have felt so overwhelmed by all of that. Uh, so we are the light of the world. So how does that saying make you feel? What a powerful statement. And how does it make you feel to think about that right now? Uh, Jesus wants us to be a powerful light. Now, who's been a guiding light in your life? Everybody has somebody who has been a guiding light in their life. And who is seeing their way more clearly because of the light that you are shining in the lives of people? Jesus went on to say, A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 15. Uh, from the coastal towns like Capernaum and Tiberias and other towns around the Sea of Galilee. There are towns up on the mountaintops that surround the Sea of Galilee. And towns on the top of these mountains are places like Safat, a very traditional Jewish town, or Hippos, a, a Gentile town, or Gadara, from that famous man from Gadara. And all of these towns can be seen clearly from the Sea of Galilee because all of them have little lights in them and they become very obvious. Jesus said, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. No matter how small your light is, your light can be seen by people who are living in the darkness. This is why Jesus said, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 15. Now, this is an example of an olive oil lamp from the first century. Just a tiny, very simple little lamp. But in the dark place, that little wick of oil, uh, that little wick in the, in the olive oil in that jar will give off light to everyone in the house to see. It doesn't take much light to light up a room. And Jesus wants his followers to be light in the dark places we visit in the course of living. And when he was talking about dark places, he was not talk necessarily talking about physically dark, but people whose hearts are dark because of their experience with light. There's no light in their eyes. There's no life that's radiating out of them, joy of what God is doing in their lives. So he said, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. What a powerful invitation. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16. And Jesus doesn't need us to rant in private or in publicly in places like social media, Facebook and wherever, TikTok, and just go off on what's wrong with the, your country, what's wrong with your leaders, what's wrong with your family. What's wrong. It's easy to do that. Jesus just simply wants us to be light just like we are being at this very moment. Jesus needs you to be light. We radiate Jesus when we share with people about the good things that God has done for us. One day I was invited to a dying man who had never been to church as an adult. He was taken as a child and had some resentment, a story you hear so often. He didn't believe in Jesus, but because he was on his deathbed, he was willing for me to visit with him. And I spoke with him about what Jesus had done for me. I shared verses with him from my Bible invited him to give his life to Jesus. and God touched him, and he opened his heart. I was so surprised. And he asked Jesus to forgive him from all of his sins and to receive him as his Savior. And just before I got, off, got up to leave, he said to me, before you leave, I have, I have one question I need to ask you. The whole time that you were speaking to me, a light was shining on me, out of your Bible, directly at me. What was that light? The man wanted to know. And I shared with him what we're talking about today, this powerful saying of Jesus, I am the light of the world. 
And a few days later, Mr. Clinton Parker went to heaven to be with Jesus because the light of God, the light of Jesus had shined on his heart and opened him to receive Jesus as his Savior. Perhaps, if you've been listening to this message, the light of Jesus has been shining to you. Perhaps as you've been listening online, you've seen the light of Jesus shining out of my hands right now or even right out of my heart, and you know that God is speaking to you right now through this message. I invite you to do what Mr. Clinton Parker did. Pray with me and thank Jesus for dying for you in your place on the cross. Thank him for paying for all of your sins and accept him as your Savior right now. Oh, God, thank you for the privilege of speaking about these powerful sayings of Jesus. We invite men and women, young people or old, to receive Jesus as their Savior right now. If you just prayed with us to receive Jesus, write to me and let us know what God has done for you today. Father, we thank you for Jesus, the light of the world. Thank you, Father. We ask that your light shine brightly in our hearts, in our minds, in our thinking, in our choices, that we will lead others to find the way to you. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope this message has filled you with living hope in Jesus. If you would like to talk to someone about your spiritual journey, please leave a comment or send us a private message. We enjoy reading your notes and having an opportunity to pray with you. If you received a blessing through this message, please share it with others. We invite you to become a Living Hope Partner by donating as little as a dollar a month through our QR code. Your gifts will help us create new messages and reach more people. Living Hope is a ministry of Ingleside International Incorporated. All donations for Living Hope qualify as a charitable contribution. Thank you for your prayers and support. Next week, we will continue learning together from the Word of God. God bless you and fill you with living hope.